Hello, principals, and welcome to the NAESP Principal Podcast. My name is Rachel George, and I'm an educational leader in Oregon and an NAESP fellow. And my name is Adam Welcome. I'm an educator in California and a, a fellow with NAESP in the Innovation Center. So Adam and I are so excited to bring you all this NAESP Principal Podcast so we can talk about real ideas with amazing principles to help make your leadership stronger and more innovative. And you are in for a treat today. So I am just so excited to introduce our, our guest, um, David Jaimes. He is an administrator in the state of Oregon. Check this out. He's also a school board member, not in the same district friends, but in another one. And he is all about kids and equity and quality education. And I'm just so excited to have him on the show and also to have him in my PLN. So David, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Rachel, for having me here. I'm so excited to be here. I just want to know, first off, how is it being an administrator and a school board member? <clears throat> my dad was a teacher and a school board member in the district where I grew up. And this was like 30 years ago. I just want to know, I mean, there's a lot happening with school board meetings right now. I see so many news reports and things happening. I mean, how is, how is that? And also too, how has being an educator helped inform you as a school board member? Because we know there's no prerequisite for being a school board member. You could be a farmer or just a person and be a board member. So how is that? How is that going on right now? That's correct. Thank you, Adam, for the question. Um, I actually am having a lot of fun doing both. And I believe that both of them um, go hand in hand. And the reason why is because all the information, all the insider information, you could say that I gather from being an administrator, I can put towards uh, my work as a board member. And so that right there, I think is a very valuable. To your point though, of anybody could be a board member, that is so true. And actually uh, that's one of the reasons why I decided to become a board member was because I saw that there weren't that many educators on our school board. And so not being an educator, the board meetings were taking long, they were taking so long, uh, we, the directors had to explain everything to, uh, to the board members. And, you know, it's just questions that were unnecessary, because they didn't really understand education and the things that we are trying to do. Um, and I think that that's one of the main reasons why we're seeing all of those tumultuous board meetings that we are having. It's because the board members do not understand the fact that you know, we're not teaching critical race theory in our classrooms, that we are for equity. And equity means not giving everybody the same thing, but giving them the tools that they need to have equitable outcomes in. And what that means is graduating everybody that we can, right? And so with that in mind, if we are unable to understand the goal of education, especially right now, which is to, you know, graduate as many students as we can, bring them to be productive citizens in our society with, you know, the technology, with, uh, with everything that we have now learned, you know, we, we are doing them a disservice. And so that's why I'm very excited to be both a, an administrator and a board member, because I'm able to bring both aspects into, into every decision that I make. That's awesome. And I really, really enjoy watching you on social media, on Twitter and Facebook, as you kind of pull back those curtains and you really examine and share those pieces. So thank you. Yes. So educational equity, I know is just one of your huge passion areas. And that's one of the things that I just love and admire about you. And I'm just always cheering you on with it as you share. So can you share with our listeners a little bit about your why? Yes. So, um, I was born in Mexico City, and so I'm an immigrant to this country. And you know, one of the the things that I have always in the you know in the forefront of my mind is that uh, I want to be better so that I can fulfill that dream that my parents had when they brought us here. 
So that's that's one of the many um, foundational values that I have. And the other that play into why I believe so hard in equity is that I'm still seeing inequities that are happening to students now and to families now that were happening when I was going to school in the United States educational system. And so, so because of that, I want to be, you know, a decision maker in changing those systems that are oppressive or that are systemically racist in nature. And, and that is why, um, that is my why. My why is to be able to change those systems. And um, ever since, you know, I, I started school here in the US, I, I noticed that I was treated differently. I noticed that, um, you know, I didn't have the same opportunities as other kids. And people might say, well, how could you notice that if you were so young? But let me tell you, you can tell when you're treated differently. And so if, if it hadn't been for the fact that, um, you know, one of my guidance counselors at the high school saw me in the hallway and said, hey, you're so-and-so's brother, right? Yeah, I have a, uh, I just got something about a scholarship at the University of Oregon for underrepresented minorities. Have you ever thought about going to college? And I was like, no, but okay. So if it hadn't been for that, you know, chance meeting, I probably wouldn't be here because I don't think I would have gone to college. And and so so that all of those things play a part into into why I'm doing this, into the the fact that you know representation matters, and having people that look like you in these positions uh, actually give you um, a window in or a mirror actually into looking at oh I can I can be there I I can see myself there. So, David, do you really trace where you are now back to that encounter and that one simple question in the hallway from the counselor? That is a pivotal moment in my educational uh, career. Wow. Wow. So I think that, that first of all, that's an amazing story. Um, and then secondly, it's, you know, big plans and programs are important but simple questions and just asking and inviting kids or adults or community members those obviously are life-changing as well too which kind of takes us to our next question is what are some tips for fostering creating educational equity opportunities um so not just in school but then outside of school and then beyond the k-12 um, for educators, for board members, because you're wearing multiple hats. It's awesome. Uh, for parents, for police officers, I mean, for anything. I know that's a really big, broad question, David, but what are your thoughts on that and giving some ideas and tips for um, all of our listeners out there? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, I think one of the things that has helped me along my career is being a good listener and actually listening to what people have to say which is another reason why I like being a board member is because you listen from the community. And I think when you start actually listening, you start seeing who is at the table and who is missing. And if you're trying to make decisions for a group of marginalized uh, people and they, you don't have any of them being represented at the table, at the decision table, then that's when you should be like, oh, Red flag, red flag, we need to we need to get their voice. Because what I found during my educational career is that we were trying to make things better. We were trying to change those systems and we didn't have the voices of the people that we needed to have. And so we're just making these decisions without, uh, without acknowledging what their struggles are. And when we do that, where those decisions that we make don't really hit the mark. And so if we sit down and we listen to the people that our decisions are gonna affect, then we can fully understand and comprehend the, the, the problem that we're trying to solve, right? Because if not, then, then we don't have that context. So that has definitely helped me out. And, and I would invite anybody to have listening sessions with their communities to have um, those 
the that dialogue you know just sitting in sitting in community with students sitting in community with our parents um, and and having having those relationships built so that you can actually listen to what they have to say every time i um we have a meeting with our latinx uh, parents and we ask do you have any questions you know it's like crickets but it's because we haven't filled we haven't um built that community around them we just we just have this meeting right we have this meeting through zoom we haven't built any community we haven't um sat down and you know this is gonna sound cliche but like broke bread with them you know just we haven't had those um that engagement that is needed before they can actually trust you and give you their um their opinions and let me tell you once you've done that they will give you their opinions they will let you know i mean i have parents calling me at all times of the day because i have built that uh, trust with them and and just built that collective efficacy so that we can make those things better so that's what that that would be my main suggestion is go out and be in community with the people that you are trying to serve and once you do that they will start opening up and you can listen and make things better for them i love it thank you thank you thank you so kind of shifting gears a little bit as you're doing this important work that is the right work i imagine sometimes you come across maybe people that aren't as open or receptive to it so what are your thoughts about maybe one or two tips about how you respond to others in these situations and circumstances Yes, thank you. Um, unfortunately, I do receive a lot of uh, pushback when, uh, you know, trying to make these decisions because, and it's because um, there's a lack of ed education out there of what equity actually means. And, um, you know, people are thinking that equity is like a pie. And if I give somebody a bigger piece, you know, they're going to get less, right? And so equity is not a pie. Um, it is about using our resources wisely and making sure that everybody gets what they need. And so, you know, with, with that being said, when I encounter, when I encounter that pushback, I always listen to what they have to say. And I make sure that I let them know that I'm fully understanding what they're saying, but also I ground myself in the fact that our students are the ones that are suffering if I don't push back on, on what they're, um, I guess that's kind of hard to say, push back on their pushback, but you know what I'm trying to say. Um, <laughs> If I don't stand my ground and if I don't stand in my, um, you know, my foundation of the fact that I need to make those equitable outcomes for our students, then um, I, if I back down, I'm, I'm gonna, the students are the ones that are gonna suffer. And so I have to make sure that I listen to what they're trying to say to me and to understand where they're coming from. But at the end of the day, we have those universal values. And if, if, our, if we change what we're doing because people don't like it, I mean, no, not, you're not going to agree with everybody, right? But if you're grounded in that foundational of we're trying to make equitable outcomes for all of our students, then that's how you will be able to feel well or feel good about the decisions that you're making on a daily basis. Yeah, I love that as well, David. And I'm just going to I'm going to start taking David's approach. Just listening to you talk, I'm so calm right now, David. I love how you approach and I can just I can just imagine. I mean, I think we've all seen video clips of school board meetings and people getting just heated and <sighs> I'm going to project that you approach your board meetings and your job as a leader and uh, all of these conversations about equity and people maybe having different opinions than we may have with just a calm 
a calm approach because when you throw baking soda onto a fire, it's going to calm the fire. But if we throw lighter fluid or gasoline, we all know what we get. We just get a bigger fire. And when the fire is bigger and hotter, it's it's so much harder to put it out. And living on the West Coast, we know about forest fires the last few years. And Rachel's previous life, she was a smoke jumper, jumping from airplanes. Um, so one more question, David. There are so many books and articles and people talking um out there in the world, but also in the education space around equity. I mean, I have many good friends. Uh, shout out to my friend Howard Fields, who's a director of HR in Missouri, who has a book and speaks on equity. What would be your recommendations on resources or books or articles or just websites for people to learn more, connect more, uh, better understand maybe what they don't understand because um, I think so much of it is how we are raised and our perspective and how how the information is brought into our lives. So um, what what resources would you say um, would help people to just broaden their perspective? Go for it. Yeah, we have, um, I've read several books, um, you know, not just because Rachel uh, is here, but, you know, she's got a great book out there principal did so you know definitely read that one if you haven't um aside from that you know dr kendy's how to be an anti-racist um that's a that's a great book elena aguilar coaching for equity that is another great book that you um that if you are a principal or an administrator you definitely should uh read because you're you're gonna want to use some of those resources in there um, you've got other books like, um, you know, just co-teaching. There's another uh, interesting book that's called No Estas Solo for um, from um, Velasquez Press that, um, you know, it's, it's about having or building that efficacy in parents to become leaders. And I believe it's in Spanish and English. I ordered the one in Spanish because obviously I was trying to coach the Latinx um, parents, but, you know, um, the, that book also was a good one. Um, there's another book that I can't remember the author, but um, it, it's uh, reading, writing uh, for anti-racist, I believe. Oh, gosh, no, I, anyway, I mean, there's some, there's a million resources out there that are, you know, geared towards equity and, and inclusion. And so um, right now, I'm big into Jose, Dr. Jose Medina because he's a, you know, bilingual educator and he um, he's doing a lot of workshops for us in um, the district that I work at. And so, um, you know, just those, those inclusion, inclusionary books that are out there. Really good tips. Those were some new titles for me. So thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you again for joining this episode of NAESP Principal Podcast. David, it has been an honor to have you with us. You brought tears to my eyes and you always motivate me and just push me to, to be better. So thank you. Um, learn more about NAESP at NAESP.org. And hey, right now we are accepting applications for proposals for the 2020 conference in Louisville, Kentucky. David, I hope you put one in. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking about all the different ways to help connect you to some folks in um, NAESP world and just nationally, because you are a gem. People, if you are not from Oregon, do not steal him. He is doing amazing work in Oregon. So we hope to see everyone next time. Thank you.